Hello, we're going to be in the little book of Philemon today. It follows the pastoral epistles just before Hebrews. It's a, the only completely personal letter from Paul that we have in the whole New Testament canon. There's some very interesting things here. Let me set the background if I could. Obviously, Paul was in prison. Uh, he was in prison several times, Caesarea Philippi, uh, excuse me, uh, Caesarea by the sea, uh, Philippi, and Rome. This context seems to be Rome. The early 60s, somewhere between 61 and 63 is the date. While in prison, uh, Epaphras brought him some information about the Lycus River Valley, particularly Colossae. And Paul wrote Colossians, and then maybe the same week, uh, uh, on the same outline, a more uh, quiet, thought-through letter that we know as Ephesians. Now, during the same period of time and to the same area, of uh, Asia Minor, or modern-day Turkey, uh, he wrote this little book of Philemon. Um, probably the same person that brought information about Colossae, uh, Epaphras, is the one who brought information about uh, the ministry of Philemon and the church at Colossae, for Philemon lived at Colossae. That's where Onesimus had run away from. Now, this is a, a, a neat little letter that deals with Paul having met and one to the Lord, a runaway slave named Onesimus. And now he's sending this slave back to his original owner, not as a slave, but as a brother. And Paul very tactfully deals uh, with the issue of slavery as it compares to the Christian faith. Though Paul never speaks against slavery, the uh, unconditional love and equality of all men uh, inherent in the gospel message would eventually destroy slavery. Uh, as a world economic system. So let's look at this book together if we could then. I know it says Paul, which means little. Uh, Paul, Saul, coming into Greek, means effeminate. So maybe he always had two names, Saul and Paul. Paul means little. Uh, traditionally, his uh, physical statue had been sharp, bald, uh, bow-legged, bushy-eyebrowed, and so was not a very attractive man. And some think the little meant physically. Others think that Paul's recurrent theme about I'm the least of the saints because I persecute the church is why he took this name little, meaning least. Notice it says a prisoner. This is the Roman imprisonment. Uh, during the Roman imprisonment, there was Colossians, Ephesians, Philemon, and Philippians written. But Philippians is written toward the end, I think, of the imprisonment, while these were written more uh, toward, the, toward the first. Um, I, I, that seems to be right when you compare Paul's view of his imprisonment, but of course we're not certain about that. Now, I, I was uh, amazed in the variety of the phrases through here and the titles for Jesus of Nazareth. Now look at verse 1, Jesus Christ. Look down at verse 3, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look down at verse 4, the Lord Jesus. Look down at verse 8, Christ. Um, and then again in verse 9, Christ Jesus. And then again over here in verse 20, the Lord's work through Christ, and then the very end, 23, Christ Jesus, 25, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, it just seems to be variety here. I don't think we can make any meaning to that. The term Lord, when used of Jesus by New Testament authors, refers to his deity because the Old Testament term for, for Yahweh, when the Jews were afraid to pronounce Yahweh, to take his name in vain, they would pronounce the Hebrew word Adonai, which we have in our Bibles, Lord. You will see Psalms 110.1, which says, The Lord said to my Lord. It's Adonai said to Yahweh. And uh, you ought to see that. Now, so it's, it's, it's to affirm Jesus' deity. Now, the word Jesus is, uh, of course, given by the angel, Matthew 1.21. It means Yahweh saves. But it's used by New Testament authors to refer to Jesus' humanity. Now, the word Christ is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word Messiah, which is uh, from the, uh, what it means is the anointed one or the, the promised coming one that would be especially equipped uh, by God to perform his task. And so here we have the humanity, deity, and title of Jesus. And those uh, phrases uh, vary from time to time. Uh, to our brother Timothy. Now, Timothy is associated with Paul in First and Second Thessalonians, uh, Second Corinthians, uh, Philippians, and here. So he was a common, faithful companion. We know that he met him on the second missionary journey after him and Barnabas had split up. Uh, Timothy, as long as Silas, became the missionary group. To our dearly loved and fellow worker Philemon. Now, obviously, Philemon was an active man in the church. And to our sister uh, Apia, Aphia. Um, now, she obviously is his wife. It's used in the sense here of Christian uh, sister. And our fellow soldier Archippus. Now, there's been some confusion here. 
fellow soldier is used in Philippians 2.25 and does describe that we are in a spiritual battle. The metaphor of warfare, of course, used in Ephesians 6.10 and following. Now, Archippus may be the pastor of this church, as we learn from Colossians 4, uh, uh, 4 through 7, excuse me, 3 through 7, Colossians 4, 3 through 7, or he may be the son of this family. And we're not sure, though pastor seems to be probable, because the church is going to meet in Philemon's home. Now, the word church is the word ecclesia, which means the called out ones with the idea of divine uh, agency. It, it is, was used by the authors of the Septuagint to translate the Hebrew word kahal, which means the congregation of Israel. So the New Testament authors chose a term that meant to say we are the same people of God of the Old Testament. Now the word church meant a town gathering, but it, the New Testament authors filled it with new meaning and meant the divinely called out ones, okay? That meets in your house. Now, there's no uh, record of church buildings until the third century. Let me give you some references of churches that met in people's homes. We have 1 Corinthians 16, 19, Romans 16, 5, Acts 2, 46, Acts 5, 42, and Acts 20, 20. And so the wealthier people, the ones who had homes, would open their homes to worship services. Sometimes there were several worship services in the same city, but only one church. Now, notice where it mentions, spiritual blessing be with you in peace. It's the idea of grace and peace. Some think it links the Hebrew background, shalom, for peace, and the Greek greeting, which is karin, which Paul slightly changes to charis, which means grace instead of greeting, uh, and makes it uniquely Greek and Hebrew. I think that's probably reading too much here. It's simply a Christianized form of the normal greeting in that day. It'd be like our dear John sincerely. That's what we have here. Notice what it mentions here, our father. Now you must remember that father is an interpersonal title for God. It, it speaks of God as a loving, compassionate family member, just as God is husband or God is Goel. But we must remember this has nothing to do with sexuality and nothing to do with chronological sequence. Okay, Jesus has always been God and always been with the Father, and the Trinity has been described to human beings in intimate, personal, family terms. Uh, now in verse 4, we have a new paragraph division. The introduction is over. Uh, I always thank my God every time I make mention of you in my prayers. It's a characteristic of Paul to praise and to pray for those who he's writing to. The only place he kind of changes that is Corinth, because they were really stinkers. Um, because I continue to hear of the love and faith you have in the Lord Jesus. Now, this idea of love and faith, this is paralleled in Colossians 2, uh, excuse me, Colossians 1, 4, where it's the ideal maybe of faithfulness and uh, love. Now, the faithfulness is toward Jesus, and the love is toward others because we're faithful to Jesus. Maybe that's the, the idea here. You might want to see the 26 translations of the New Testament, which give a variety of verses 5 and 6, which has been the crux of much translation problem, and you can see how those different translators uh, deal with that. Um, by the way, the word faith is the same Greek root as, the, as translated in English, believe, trust, and faith, all this are the same Greek root, pistis, or the verb pistuo. So we can't catch in one simple word uh, the concept of faith, belief, or trust. I've done a tape on that, what is faith, where I try to explicate those meanings. I hope you'll send for our free catalog. Uh, now, notice it mentions here, uh, faith in the Lord Jesus and his people. This is the word saints. It's used again down in verse 7. Uh, it's from the root holy, hagias, and it means those set apart for God's service. It goes back to the Old Testament use of the term. Now, we are saints not because we live a certain way, but we're saints because of our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You might well see 2 Corinthians 5.21. Now, hopefully our position in Christ, as the Holy Spirit makes us more like Christ, will possess our position and will live more like Him. That's the goal. That's the goal of faith, from a faithful God to man's faith to faithful men. And so we're moving toward Christ's likeness, but we have Christ's likeness positionally because of our faith and repentance in Jesus Christ and what He has done, His finished work. Notice then it says, and I pray that their sharing, this is the word koinonia, means joint participation in, uh, your faith may result in their recognition in us of everything that is right with reference to Christ. And of course, here's the uh, beautiful idea of uh, that somehow in our witness others see Jesus. Look at that 26 translation. It'll help you here on the confusion of this verse with the translations. Yes, I felt great joy and encouragement over your love because of, now mine has hearts, but it's the word bowels. To the ancients, the lower viscera was the seat of the emotions. And if you ever had a, 
you ate too late and tried to go to bed, you get the stomach cramps, you know why they thought it was the seed of the emotions. Uh, to the bowels of God's people have been refreshed by you, my brother. Now, Paul's going to be extremely tactful this man. He's going to try to move him to a spiritual decision about Onesimus, but he's going to do it in freedom, not in a command. And we see that beginning in verse 8. So although through union with Christ, now that's in Christ, Paul's favorite phrase, a locative of sphere, which means he moves and lives and has his being in Jesus Christ, I have full freedom to order you. And this, of course, is, a, is a affirmation of Paul's apostolic authority, which was the official authority of Christ as his representative. Now, I think it's important that we realize, number one, that he didn't use it here, and he doesn't use it too often except in the place of heresy or rebellion. He usually uses freedom and encouragement and exhortation. But when it comes down to it, Paul says, I, Paul, apostle of Jesus Christ, say unto you, this is the word of the Lord. Now, I believe there are several polity structures in the New Testament. We're moving from those original men called by God to be the official leaders and teachers, the apostles. But they're beginning to die. And we move from that to a combination of church leaders and apostles. We see that in Acts. Acts 15 is a good example, uh, which we would call the Presbyterian system today. We're moving from Episcopal to Presbyterian. And finally, the whole congregation affirms the decision of those few. We see that in Acts 6. We see it in Acts 15. We see it throughout these deals. We're going to see it in this chapter too. So I think we're moving from those gifted leaders who had ultimate authority because of their relationship with Jesus to congregational authority where the people of God as a whole make spiritual decisions. Now I want to say to you, this is not majority rules. This is hopefully Holy Spirit-led praying about God's will for the church, not personal opinion. And we've kind of messed up congregational polity in the years. Um, now I want to say to you, uh, verse 9, Yet I prefer to appeal to you for love's sake, although... I am such as I am. Now, Paul's saying, I want you to do it voluntarily, but I want to tell you, I could order you if I so chose. Uh, Paul, an envoy. Now, you may have Paul the aged. There's only a vowel change between the term for age and the term for ambassador. And uh, if, these if the copies that we have in the New Testament were done orally, one person read it and others copied it, you can see how uh, ambassador or elder got, got mixed up. Now, I think the best manuscripts, probably elder, is better. But because of the parallel uh, found in Colossians, some think ambassador is better. Now, age is in King James, New American Standard, American Standard, NIV, and Jerusalem Bible. Ambassador is in the New English Bible and the, Revi and the Revised Standard Version. I really think age is probably right. We learn from Hippolytus that, uh, oh, about 40-something 40, 40 through the 50s was considered to be an aged person. Um, okay, but uh, of Christ Jesus, but now a prisoner for him too. This allusion to him being in change, even as he wrote the letter, is found throughout here. Uh, yes, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus. It's a common rabbinical phrase for someone who was a student. Here, Paul uses it as someone who accepted Christ under his ministry, Onesimus. This is a common name for a slave. It means useful Many of the slaves were named useful or profitable or beautiful or helpful. And so it's a very common name. My child Onesimus, whose father I've become while wearing these chains. Another allusion to the imprisonment. Once he proved useless, but now he is useful to you and me. This is a play on Onesimus' name. His name meant useful or profitable is the idea. Now this is a play on that. Once he was not useful to you, but now he is yeah, because he's been saved. And, and that's the idea here. Now, in verse 12, uh, another interesting thing, it says, I am sending him back to you. Now, apparently, he was a runaway slave. This was a very serious social crime. Uh, there were slave hunters. You could be uh, uh, killed for this or severely wounded physically or branded. And so it was a very serious crime. And Onesimus did a, 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 a social evil in his day. And notice Paul says, you've got to go back and face your medicine, son. Uh, I'd like to keep you. I know you've got a brand new heart. I know you're a brand new creature but you've got to go back and face what you did. That's a good word for us. We are responsible for our acts. Just because we're saved doesn't wipe out all the evil we've done in the past. We as believers have to try to make restitution. I think restitution is a missing element of the preaching today. Friends, if we've wronged somebody, whether we were before we were a Christian or afterward, we need to make it right. We need to make it right. It's, it's the same concept as confessing your sins one to another, but it's putting feet to your confession and trying as best you can to make it right. So that is what he's saying here. 
We need to take seriously the evil that we do and have done and try to make it right in Jesus' name. Now, this uh, refer this case to you is how it is a little more literally. In verse 2, linked with the church, it seems to mean that Paul is asking uh, uh, Philemon to put this before the whole church. Let the whole church decide what to do with Onesimus. That seems to be the idea of uh, refer the case to you uh, because the church met in his home. But maybe it just means that he's asking for a personal decision. We can't tell. Now, he sent him back with Tychicus. Tychicus is the bearer of the letter of Colossians and Ephesians. We see that in Colossians 4, 7 through 9, and Ephesians 6, 21 and 22. Obviously, Onesimus went with them, and Tychicus had the letter to Philemon also, uh, which is all the same as sending my own very heart. Now, Paul said, I'd like to have kept him here. He's, he's been a joy to me, a help to me, and I love him to death, but I'm sending him back to you because it's only right and only fair. I would have liked him to, uh, to keep him with me, to wait on me in your stead. Paul's saying, kind of like uh, Epaphrodites had done to, for the Philippian Christians, Philippians 2.25, they had sent Epaphroditus to help Paul. Uh, he said, I wish I could have kept Philemon as your representative of your love to me. But Paul said, it wouldn't have been fair, and I'm sending him back home to you. Um, but I would not do a single thing about it without your consent. Notice how tactful Paul is. Notice how not overbearing he is. That's so important. For, uh, so that this kindness of yours to me might be seen to come not by compulsion, but voluntary. Now, I want to tell you, that is a New Testament principle. I think the principal guidelines of spiritual giving are given to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. And voluntary, freely, is repeated over and over. Anytime Christian giving becomes a compulsive uh, uh, amount or a compulsive time or a compulsive manner, it is not New Testament. To say the tithe is God's will and if you don't do it, you're sinning, is compulsion, not voluntary. Now, I think Christians ought to give far beyond the tithe. I hope you'll send for my tape on, on principles of spiritual giving that are based on 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Because I think a lot of preaching I hear today is self-centered motive. You give a dollar and God will give you a hundred dollars. That's, that's not the idea. I think we fully see the truth here that volunteerism is the key because it deals with the attitude of the heart. And I want to tell you, the attitude of the heart is the key in Christianity in every area, whether it's trusting Christ or walking with Christ or stewardship or ministry or service or use of spiritual gift. The attitude of the heart is the determining factor, not the action, but the attitude. And that's true here with Philemon, as in everything we do for God. Now, notice where it mentions here in verse 15. For perhaps it was for this reason that he was uh, parted from you. This is a passive verb, and this smacks of predestination, uh, that God let Onesimus run away so that Onesimus would become a Christian and come back and help Philemon. Now, from Ignatius later on, we, as he was on his way to Rome to be killed, he mentions that Onesimus uh, was the bishop of Ephesus. Maybe it's the same guy, but it's a common slave name. We're not sure. But I want to say to you that though I certainly believe with John Calvin, Augustine, and Paul that God chooses and elects, that God is in control of history, both of nations and individuals, that there is a plan and purpose for our life, that we are destined to some extent. And though I think that's a biblical theme that we cannot ignore or relegate to some philosophical determinism, I also say with you that the balance of New Testament truth is the fact that man must respond. Just as man's attitude of voluntarism is important, man's attitude of faith and repentance in light of the initiating grace of God is a must. And so I say to you that though I want to affirm predestination, I also want to affirm free will. And I want to give equal biblical weight to those dialectical pairs. I think most truths come in dialectical pairs. I've done several tapes on this subject. Uh, the security of the believer versus the perseverance of the saints predestination versus free will, original sin versus volitional sin, the Bible, human and divine, Jesus, fully God, fully man. Now, I personally believe that all major truths come in these dialectical pairs. And so I think we must see here that Paul says God had a purpose in this. Now, that does not take away Onesimus' guilt from running away, which he has to go back and face. And it does not take away Philemon's free will in doing what he will as a result of that. But it does say that God has a plan and purpose in every aspect of our lives. And I believe that's exactly what Romans chapter 8, 
verse 28 and tw through 30 is all about. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And then it moves into that string of great things. He called us and chose us and all of that. Find it would be like Christ. I think all things in our, for the Christian are working to our Christ likeness. Now you can see that as predestination or you can see that as man yielding. They're both true and the goal of both is God's glory in our Christ likeness. That's true here in 15. Onesimus found the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, God was involved in that. Amen. Onesimus had to respond. True. If I have to choose one side of that equation, which I don't, but if I had to, I would have to go with predestination and election because God's sovereignty is a much more significant theological truth than man's free will though man's three will is a biblical corollary. They're glued together. Now, notice it mentions here in verse 16, not as a slave any longer, but more than a slave, a dearly loved brother. Now, here is the emphasis of Christianity on the equality of all men and the need for Christian brothers to respond in God's kind of love to one another. The biblical uh, universal is that we are be subject one to another out of respect for Christ. That is Ephesians 5, uh, 21. Now, you might want to look at Galatians 3.28 or Colossians 3.11 where equality is linked. We're no more male or female or Jew or Greek or, you know, uh, uh, slave or free. We're all one in Jesus Christ. But don't stop there, my friends. That's one part of the dialectic. The other is found in Ephesians 6, 5 through 9 where it says, Slaves, serve your masters as you serve God and God will reward you. Now, though there is equality, there is still the structures of society in which we must move in Christ-like submission out of respect for Jesus. And so though equality is a biblical truth, we must live in the society which God has placed us in peace and quiet and love. Now, those balance are there, friends. They're both true. Just saying God says we're all equal doesn't totally remove the distinction between men and women, uh, between uh, Jews and Gentiles, between masters and slaves. It changes the relationship. It moves it to a much higher realm, but it is not eliminated automatically. It will be eliminated in heaven. It is not here. Now, notice where it says, so if. Now, the if of 17 and 18 are both first-class conditional sentences assumed to be true, which I believe for English readers should be sense. They're affirmations. If you consider me a comrade or a koinonia, a, a co-sharer in the gospel, uh, now, this is the idea. Since you do consider me a friend and co-worker and comrade, take him to your bosom as you would me. Now, you ought to see a Matthew 25, 44, and 45 for that. Uh, and if he did steal, he did cause troubles, he did cause problems for Philemon, if he has done you any wrong and owes you anything, charge it to my account, present imperative. What Paul's saying is, I know this was an inconvenience. I know he probably did things wrong. But Philemon, put it on my tab, not on his. It's a command. It's not an option, okay? Uh, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. Now, this, whether Paul wrote the whole letter, which seems possible because of its short length, or whether he had a scribe write it and he took the pen at this point, I'm not sure, but probably he wrote the whole thing. But Paul writing in his own hand was a sign of the genuineness of the Pauline letters. There were some forgeries going around in his name. You might well see 2 Thessalonians 3.17 where Paul says, uh, I write this with my own hand. Okay, it was, it was his way of verifying that he wrote these letters. I will pay it in full, not to mention the fact that you owe me for your very self besides. Now, Paul kind of says, I'm going I'm to ask you to do it, but you ought to do it because you know who I am and who you are. Now, apparently Philemon was a part of Paul's ministry some way. We know that Paul did not start the churches of the Lycus River Valley, Hierapolis, Laodicea, and Colossae. Paul did work in Ephesians, which is down at the mouth of that river, and apparently Philemon was converted into Paul's ministry and then went back to Colossae or moved to Colossae, whatever. But he seems to be a convert personally of Paul and not of Epaphroditus, who started the churches there. Um, yes, brother, I would like some return myself from you in the Lord's work. Through, through Christ, refresh my heart. Now, here's Paul urging him to act appropriately towards man. I write you with perfect confidence and the, in the uh, compliance with my wish because I'm sure that you'll do even more than I ask. Have a guest room ready for me. Paul expects to be released from prison. That seems to fit with Colossians and Ephesians, but not with Philippians. He expects to die. So it's written at two different times. 
uh, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner, there's a guy who started the churches there, uh, in the cause of Christ Jesus, which we remembered to you. So do Mark, Archippus, Demas, and Luke. Now, all these guys are mentioned in Colossians 4, 10 through 14. And these same group of guys are dealt with in 2 Timothy chapter 4, about verse 9 through 11. They were a group. Demas is going to flake off. John Mark is going to be reaccepted by Paul. Uh, Archippus was a leader in that church. And Luke, of course, is, a, is the physician uh, that became a missionary companion with Paul. So here, when I preached on this passage out of 2 Timothy, I called the, the, the once outs, <laughs> the dropouts, and the faithful. And there's different kind of men, even in these leaders. Some are once out, John Mark, but now in. Uh, Demas fell out, and Luke was faithful all the way through. You ought to see that. I think it's beautiful. The spiritual blessings, grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, be with your spirit. And Paul concludes this epistle on that note. Wouldn't it be interesting if Onesimus was the later bishop of, of Ephesus, which means Philemon made him free, and he became a leader in the church? Oh, man, I, I don't know. It, it, there's so many names like that. Be, like using the word Bob in our day. But um, I tell you, I, when we get to heaven, we've got some of the most exciting stories for us and all the, these intrigues that we never understood. I want to tell you, God is, has done something in these people's lives. No one may know their name but God, but what a story of faith and love and work and service and fear and all the rest involved in all these names. Philemon, we don't know anything else about him. But he, he apparently did a good job with what Paul asked him to do. Well, I've enjoyed being with you. I'll see you again, same time, same place, next week. God bless you.